He has not forgot about that lineage. Scattered, dispersed, called Negro, called nigger, called by words and proverbs, sent to the four corners of the earth, mixed in, Hellenized, sausage, egg and cheese biscuits, pork chops, running in Coliseum games, shooting each other on the street, gang violence, bloods, crips, homicide rape, poor health, leading in cardiovascular disease. Y'all said I ain't forgot about my people. The nations may forget, but I ain't gonna forget. I ain't gonna forget about the transatlantic. I ain't gonna forget about Alligator Bay. I ain't forget, gonna forget about Willie Lynch and Lynch Negroes and Piccaninnies. I ain't gonna forget. And that's the power of a living God that took a book that was always ours and made the enemy think, oh, this is for everybody. Just so he could get that book to the four corners of the earth so that when he woke up the remnant of his people that were scattered because of their disobedience, he could wake them up with a snap of his face. That's the love we're gonna talk about in this video, y'all. All right. Now look at these. Yeah, I'm telling you, I gotta show y'all. A, a, a picture speaks a thousand words. Just look for yourself. And this is the creme de la creme. All praises be to the Most High, y'all. Everything we've been through, y'all, the Most High is gonna retribute it on all the nations that have had a hand in the oppression of his apple, the apple of his eye, his chosen people, his beloved, his fervent lover, his only begotten, they gonna have their part in the lake of fire. You see them tormented by some kind of creature, I don't even know what that even is, y'all. Judgment, in chains, he that led into captivity shall go into captivity. All praise to the Most High God. What group of people have gone through the full extent of this terror, servitude, yoke of iron, a nation with an uh, eagle image, immigrants coming in after them rising up and getting reparation offers, their kids being sold into captivity. You having kids but not enjoying them because they splitting up families. You betrothing a wife but another man laying with her. Y'all got to look at the power of a prophecy prophesied thousands of years ago. Moses was a bad man but even more bad than Moses was the Most High Yah. The dreadful and terrible Almighty Creator who prophesied every lick of this on our black behinds and it came to pass without fail. Now let's look at verse 68. It said, thou that dwells in the clefts of the rock. Whoa, I know a lot of y'all know about the Caucasus Mountains. Let's just let the word speak. Let's go to verse four. Though you exalt yourself as the eagle, and though you set thy nest among the stars, What's up, Zion Dynasty? This is your favorite dreaded Israelite, the man, the myth, and the legend, Mr. J.B. Zion. Y'all show me some love, show me some love. Let's go! Yoruba, Benaya Ephraim of the tribe of Joseph, of the son of Jacob, i.e. Israel. That is an Israelite, and we back on the channel, y'all. About to hit y'all with another uh, uh, uh. Anger, all praises, honor, glory, dominion, power to the mighty one of Jacob, the holy one of Israel, even the most high God. Y'all give all glory to the most high God. So first, I want to say peace, love, blessings, black power to the chosen race of the most high God. Even all my Israelite brothers and sisters, I could not do this work without y'all. Y'all mean everything to me. Just, I couldn't thank you enough for just supporting, for encouraging us, for donating, for everything. And I also want to extend a warm peace, love, blessings, and black power to all our Gentile brethren. Not the ones that's trolling, but all the ones that's not lost in the sauce, all the ones that's supporting this work, all the ones that are supporting this awakening of the 12 tribes of Israel, the greatest nation to ever walk this earth. I want to thank y'all from the bottom of my heart, me and Chani D, we could not do this without y'all. Y'all mean everything to us. You keep us motivated. Right when I feel like, man, I don't know if I'm really making an impact. I don't know if this is really what I'm meant to do. Y'all come in and just drop, keep rock rolling king and just so much encouragement and I thank y'all. So this was gonna be a little bit different y'all. We have been talking about our Esau series, y'all already know. And before, I always forget this part. But before we get rolling, if you wanna support 
I'm gonna put that cash app on the screen. Every donation puts us one step closer to throw our entire sales at this, to do this full time, so we can be able to do more breakdowns, go deeper into the scholarship, deeper into the DNA, deeper into the archeology, span deeper into the apocrypha, deeper into all these things, y'all. Cause I have so much that I have lined up that I wanna do, but it's a juggling act right now. But yeah, so you are, you guys already know, we've been dealing with our Esau series. We've been talking about Edom. We talked about how Edom is that last ruling empire, that last governmental world system that would exist before the return of Yeshua to establish his kingdom for the 12 tribes of Israel, judging all the nations, leading the remnant of the nations that's left into captivity, our servants in the kingdom. We talked about that. So we proved that we can link Edom, that last ruling government, to the ancient Roman Europeans, and we can link them back to Esau. Or we can link Esau to these Romans, and these Romans to these present day Europeans, all praises. But in today's video, y'all, this is gonna be a different one. This is gonna be a treat for you guys. I just wanna talk a little bit. <laughs> I know I come in and it's a lot of hype and it's a lot of, and y'all are loving the way we're kind of going through the history, the, the storytelling kind of way I've been doing. I just enjoy that, y'all. It it's fun for me to look at the Bible and the history as a one big legendary story. And, and I love that you guys are, are, are loving that, right? But we're going to talk about Yeshua. And, and, and like I said, guys, this is a big one. This is the big one. The entire word of the Most High hinges on the Messiah. The whole entire Bible hinges on Yeshua, right? There have been so many wars fought. There has been so much dispute, not just Christianity against Israel, but within the Israelite community about the nature of the Messiah. Now, so this is this is not a small task, y'all. I just want to get the conversation started. I'm gonna talk a little bit. I just want to see you guys' feedback. If y'all want another follow-up, we'll go into it because it's a lot right we're gonna be dealing with the concept of the messiah right we're gonna try to break it down i'm not calling this a separate series i still have some more videos left for the esau series but i do want to talk about yeshua a lot of israel has been buzzing talking about yeshua and i know that there's multiple trains of thought within the israelite community with regards to yeshua so a lot of Israel, I'm just gonna break down from the bare basic, what is the Messiah, what is the role of the Messiah, and we're gonna deal with whether or not Yeshua has fulfilled the criteria that was already prophesied in the Judeo scriptures concerning the Messiah. So let's jump into it, you guys. So first, when we're talking about the Messiah, we need to understand that this is a, a fluid concept, right? The, t the concept of the Messiah, the word Messiah or Mashiach in the Hebrew means anointed one, right? When we look at Isaiah chapter 45 with Cyrus, we talked about this when we talked about the different empires. That Cyrus of the Medo-Persian Empire was anointed and ordained of Yah to allow the children of Israel, even in captivity, to return back to the land of Israel and rebuild the temple. So now we saw that, uh, that Isaiah had showed Cyrus that Cyrus's very name was already or, ordained, that the Most High had already surnamed Cyrus way back, I think a couple hundred years, the scholars say, before Cyrus was born to let him know that he would accomplish this task in allowing Israel to turn back to their God. So Cyrus was like, man, my name's already been mentioned. And he said, I wanna come into agreement with the God of heaven, the God of these Hebrews that I believe created the heavens and the earth. So he believed in our God and he allowed Israel to go back to the land. But in Isaiah 45, the scriptures call Cyrus the Most High's anointed one, right? This is just one example, but I'll start with this one because it shows that a Gentile can also be called that, right? Now that's a bunch of where people can get lost in the sauce like with, with Donald Trump. They were saying that he was like Cyrus when he made the U.S. Embassy uh, the capital or the capital of Jerusalem or made the capital place of the U.S. Embassy Jerusalem, right? We ain't talking about no forgeries. But just based on the scriptures, we see that a Gentile ruler that comes into Yah's favor by blessing his people can be referred to as the Anointed One. Not just that. But when we look at the high priest, the high priest, the word Mashiach means anointed one or consecrated. 
The ancient concept of being anointed started with the sons of Aaron. Now, the Most High, because of Moses, Moshe Hanavi, because of Aaron, because of their faithfulness to deliver Zion and be used as instruments for the Most High to judge Egypt, the Most High used the Levites as an eternal priesthood dedicated to the Most High Yah. That means everything that had to do with righteousness, the laws, the statutes, the commandments, the consecration, the atonement, the covenants, all of that went through the Levites. And, and, and we will see in scripture that they had different Levites spread throughout all 12 tribes or all the 11 tribes, right? Each tribe had their own set of Levitical priests that were their whole duty was to consecrate the people, consecrate the temple, atone for the sins of Israel, and instruct them in righteousness and holiness. Why do I bring this all up? The word Messiah means anointed one, or one sent, one consecrated for a holy work, right? When we look at the priest, the Levite priests were literally anointed, right? There was a special apothecary oil that the Most High told Israel to not even try to replicate. This oil was dedicated solely to consecrate the sons of Aaron who were set, set aside as an eternal lineage whose sole purpose was the work of ministry, the work of the temple, the work of atoning for Israel. So the sons of Aaron were actually smeared upon, consecrated with this sacred anointing oil to represent them being set aside for the task of the temple and the atoning of Israel. So the high priest, who was the highest office of the Levitical priest, was said to be the anointed one as well, right? So we have the term Messiah, which means anointed one. We see that it can refer to a Gentile that stands for Israel and uses political power to defend Zion. And we also see from the very beginning of the word that it literally means to be smeared on, anointed, consecrated, and this had to do with the Levitical priest. Now, we're just setting the groundwork, y'all. I know this is a lot. That's why I said this might be a follow-up series. Just breaking down the concept of the Messiah. Now, I'm going to refer to another scholar and show you what their definition of what the, anoint, the anointed one was supposed to accomplish. Let's look at Dr. Windsor. So, let's look at Dr. Windsor. As you guys know, Dr. Windsor is the author of From Babylon to Timbuktu, and he also has a golden series. But we're gonna look at Judea Trembles. In Judea Trembles, um, Dr. Windsor explains the role of the Messiah. So, the word Messiah or anointed one is a fluid concept, can be referred to Gentiles, can be referred to the priest, but when we're talking about the anointed one, the anointed one, most people are talking about the Messiah savior figure, the deliverer of Israel that raises up Israel, establishes them as this world without end, this eternal kingdom, pits them in the land, makes Jerusalem the headquarters of the earth, that kind of Messiah. Now, the scriptures go through what lineage and all that thing the, the Messiah was supposed to come through, we're gonna deal with that. But first we're gonna talk about Dr. Windsor. So in Dr. Windsor's Judea Trembles Under Rome, he says that the role of the Messiah is to unite Israel, regather the 12 tribes, prevail upon them to turn back to Torah, the law, statutes, and commandments, lead them back to the land of Zion, the land of Israel, the land that was promised to Israel as an eternal birthright. We talked about the standoff between Esau and Joseph and this spiritual hindrance, this spiritual principality that seeks to stop our people from getting back to that land. So this Messiah regathers Israel, unites Israel, turn Israel, turns Israel back to Torah, gets Israel back to the land of Canaan, right? The promised land and defends Israel against all her enemies, any nation that would try to rise up and destroy Zion. Now, this is a brief summary, and I love the way Dr. Winter kind of breaks that down like that. We're going to go through scripture, but there's a lot of scripture. I just want to kind of use like a blanket um, breakdown to let you guys start thinking this is the role of the Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to break this curse, right? And I talked about that. Y'all looked at, we looked at the 400 year prophecy. A lot of you guys were like, why are we still going through this, JB? It, it was lifted in 2019. 
Um, Yeshua died to free us from this thing. There's a lot of spiritual, there's a lot of spiritual linguistics and legality that goes into this thing, you guys. So, but the Messiah, his biggest hurdle would be, like you guys pointed out, the curses of Deuteronomy 28. So, now Deuteronomy 28 is, is a massive thing to deal with, you guys. But basically, Deuteronomy 28 keeps Israel from being able to become this world without end, this autonomous nation above all nations. Because we broke the law, statutes, and commandments, it almost makes us in this perpetual cycle of being under the nations so we never can be spiritually right or spiritually justified to be exalted above nations. Why is this important to understand? Because this means that the Messiah is fighting against the spirit of our transgression which keeps the Messiah from being able to succeed in his mission to truly liberate Israel because we're trapped under the penalty of the Most High. And I know that's kind of deep, but y'all follow me. The Messiah has to come against the right that the Father has to fulfill in whooping our tail. So it's a spiritual hindrance. This is where Yeshua comes in and his first coming. Now, I don't want to go too deep, but I just let's go back to just breaking down this concept of the Messiah. So the Messiah is meant to regather Israel, unite Israel, turn them back to Torah, lead them back to the land of Zion, and fight against all of Israel's enemies successfully. This is a massive task. This is why a lot of Christians say, okay, well, the first advent of Christ was to atone, and the second coming is to fulfill the judgment on the nations and restore Israel. Now, a lot of Christians think it's just the 144. We as Israelites know that his coming back is for the entire nation. The 144 is the ruling class. I'm going to do a video on that because I just thought about it. I have not done that. It's a lot of topics, you guys. So the Messiah has to deal with this spiritual hindrance, right? Now, the Bible does give us clues as to how this Messiah would come through what lineage and all that good stuff. And this takes us back to David, all right? This is where we see one of the foundational promises that the Most High makes that sets the stage for the son of David being synonymous with the Messiah that is to come and to deliver Zion, to deliver Israel first from their own iniquity. Because if, if he doesn't deal with the fact that we're trapped and doomed to fall under the curses, he can never make Israel an autonomous nation. Let me explain that to you guys. I, I don't think I really fully explained it. If the Messiah comes and our people are still getting whooped by the Father, if he takes the children of Israel and pits them in that land and tries to fight Rome, tries to, to fight America and Russia and all these powers, he's going to lose. Understand. You got to think about this thing because he's not fighting the nations. He's fighting the curses of Deuteronomy 28, which is the most high. This stuff is deep. So somebody has to atone for that. And I know a lot of Israel, the reason I'm making this video is because we got a lot of Old Testament only. We got a lot of New Testament Christian, just regular believers. But I, I can understand where the Old Testament only are coming from. And I also can see flaws where the just pure Christian Israelites are coming from because we have to break this entire Messiah concept down to see where the hangup is. The hangup is, is Christ the man that he accomplished everything he had to accomplish based on the criteria of prophecy. The Most High knows that our people that are turning back to knowing who we are are gonna look at this and this could present a potential stumbling block. That's why I'm doing this video, y'all. To reconcile the Old Testament brothers only and let them know that Yeshua did more than what we realize. And I ain't talking about white Jesus. Detox from that out of your mind. We're dealing with the black Judean Negro that came. So let me bring up another historian. A lot of you guys may or may not have heard about John Henry Clark. He has done a beautiful segment where he explains the historical atmosphere of Yeshua. He talks about how Pompey came to power in 65 BC. 
um, that the Romans came and infiltrated the land of Judea. They had Roman soldiers. They had fallout, smoke, mothers crying because their sons are not. You had all these rebel rousers, freedom rider, Sakari, zealot groups. You had a lot of chaos going on in Judea. To add insult to injury, you had sellout coons you had Israelites that loved the Greek and the Roman culture more than their own, and they would side with the white Roman Europeans to get status, to get power, to buy the priesthood. You had cats that weren't Levites that were getting put in the high priest role. And you had the people rioting like this is against our culture, right? So the people were longing for a savior. The messianic concept was this deliverer that would save Israel from their enemies and atone for their sin because you had to atone for their sin or you would be unsuccessful against the enemies of Israel. Let me give you guys an example of that. I know this is a lot, y'all. I'm gonna make this another series, but, but basically we see in Joshua where I think the sin of Achash of the tribe of Judah, he stole some gold or something that the Most High said don't take anything. And the next time Israel went to war, they lost. And they was like, what's happening? Why are we losing to our enemies? And Achaz like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And Joshua was like, somebody has sinned against the Most High Yah. And everybody looking around. Long story short, they find out that Achaz had took some of the gold or some of the silver and hid it. The reason I bring that up is that one man sinning cost Israel the next couple of battles. This is why the sin of Israel had to be atoned for because we all have fallen short despite what any camp or any person might tell you. And I'm not bashing camps, but some they some some of those get a bad rap of saying we got to keep the commandments, which I agree with what they're saying. But some people look at that as oh y'all saying y'all perfect, which you're not saying that. But what they're saying is we need to practice the law, statutes, commandments. We need to rehearse the righteous acts. But what we all can agree on is that all of Israel has fallen short of doing this. That had to be atoned for. And if the Messiah doesn't atone for that spiritually, he's going to be unsuccessful on his campaign to deal with Negroes. Y'all know how we are. Every leader that we've had come on the scene has had to deal with Negroes. And it's a spiritual thing. We think is why can't black people unite? Why are we always killing our leaders? It's spiritual. If we violate our Torah, or if that's not atoned for by somebody, even the way we think towards one another is gonna be evil. We think that you just came up with that. No, that in your mind that causes you to hate your brother is because of the sin that's on our people. That's just a byproduct. That's just a symptom. So this stuff is deep. So the Messiah had to come and deal with that to succeed in getting us back to the land freely or Rome with a Taurus at the frame, right? So this is where Yeshua comes in. This is where we have to deal with the full package of did he succeed as the Messiah? And I argue that Mashiach Yeshua was the fullness of the Most High, the fullness of his will and bodily form. And he accomplished more than what we realize based on if you're a diehard Israelite or if you're more linked to the Christian Christian ideology. I sympathize with both groups, y'all, because this channel is all about uniting Israel. I know a lot of Christian Israelites are like, yeah, Christ is the son of God. But a lot of our diehard Israelites are like, we gotta get back to the land and the white man oppressing us. And man, Christ, boy, those Romans came and they got them. It's some of them that think like that, that Christ came, he was crucified by the Romans, and did not succeed in fulfilling the task of delivering Zion. But what I'm trying to tell you guys is that Christ prophesied in advance that all these things had to happen for him to be able to purchase spiritually the right to deliver Israel. Now I'm gonna have to do a follow up video and be like, well JB, if, if Yeshua did all of that, if he was the Messiah that knew what had to be done and he had to lay down his life on Passover and resurrect on the Sabbath and, and pay the price for Israel spiritually and then he was gonna come back. If he knew all of that, how come we're still under the curses after what he did? And this is where we deal with the grace package. Now, now y'all, before I get too deep, it's, it gets real legality, legalistic, where you have to accept the plea deal. 
you have to confess to the crime. So Israel then has to know who they are. They have to turn back to their identity as Israel, confess the sin of their forefathers. Israel cannot confess the sins of their forefathers, which is them transgressing the covenant if they don't know who they are. So if they can't accept the plea deal, the grace and the perpetuation for our sins that Yeshua made available, they can never access that. So we're still trapped under the curses. The beauty is the gospel of the kingdom. And we're going to deal with that. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to see everything Yeshua prophesied before he was crucified. Let's deal with it. Okay, family. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 4. And it reads, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, it reads, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall arise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. And all these are the, just the beginning of sorrows to come. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. We got to deal with this part. I'm going to read all the way down to 16, but we got to deal with this. There's a lot that Yeshua said. First of all, he said many shall come in his name. How did Yeshua know that his life would be the envy of the nations, would be coveted by the nations, and that people would come and say that they were him, that they were Jesus? Or this man in, 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 in Saudi Arabia or somebody saying he Jesus resurrected or somebody in London saying I'm the reincarnation of Christ. How did he know that that was going to happen? Let's look at what else he said. He said that there were going to be wars and rumors of wars. Y'all, look at what's going on right now. And I'm going to do a video on World War III, y'all. Don't think I forgot about Gog and Magog. It's coming. But we got all this Gog and Magog, Russia, and, and they trying to go against the daughter of Babylon, Edom, Americans, and then Russia doing it because Ukraine and a lot of Ukrainians are those Turkish uh, dig, um, Edomites that are the Ish people and Russia trying to take over the Middle East and World War III, all of this stuff, right? Christ said this just the beginning. Christ said when you see all these things, don't let your heart be troubled for these are just the beginning. And then he said, Israel, you're going to be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And other renditions of the gospel, it says, that they shall persecute you and think they're doing God's will. This is why the Negroes attacked. This is why we catch hell as Israel. Christ already prophesied our people were going to be oppressed by all the nations. We were going to be hated by all the nations. And then they was going to think they're doing God's will. So wars, rumors of world wars, Russia, gas prices going up, Israel catching hell, um, many false Christ arising, all of this this man Yeshua knew ahead of time. So to all my Old Testament only brothers, how did this man know this stuff? Now we're going to keep reading. But when you really scrutinize what Yeshua prophesied, he did more and knew more than what Israel is accessing. We're not tapping into the fullness of the life of Yeshua and what he left for us. Let's keep reading. So in verse 10, it says, And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many y'all look at this now and because iniquity is going to be everywhere and shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come all praises be to the most high yeah i'm gonna deal with these last two verses but we gotta look at what we just read this gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to all the world 
to be a witness against all nations. What is Yeshua talking about? He is not talking about Christianity because that's those false prophets that shall deceive many, the Christian church. He already talked about that. He knew that, that the white folks was gonna come in his name and say that they come in the name of Yeshua and Jesus and, and these Roman Catholics will go into Africa and oppress God's people and think they are doing God's will. So he's not talking about that. What is this gospel of the kingdom that he's talking about? Israel waking up. Understand that the gospel of the kingdom is short for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When we look at his first cousin, John the Baptist, y'all follow me. The first thing we see John the Baptist say is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His cousin Yeshua, who also knew very well about these Essenes, and a lot of historians believe that Christ was a part of this group that John was a part of. I ain't trying to go too deep off into that. But Christ piggybacks his first cousin by saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was Yeshua was saying? What was Yeshua talking about? Yeshua was saying that he was the herald he was the Messiah for the kingdom, the government, the revolution, the Judean black revolution, he said is at hand. And everybody like, whoa, is this the guy? Because everybody was looking for this Messiah Hebraic Israelite to come and to deliver Israel, to be the world superpower, cause a revolution, overcome the Romans, raise Israel up, unite the 12 tribes, turn them back to Torah, deliver them in war, right? So Christ comes and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We saw in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 21, that the scripture says that when you restore the kingdom as it were, when it was the days of heaven on earth. So this is talking about government. This is talking about when Israel is free from the curses and Israel set above all nations, Christ is saying, this is the kingdom of heaven. So when we see Yeshua say that the gospel of the kingdom has to be preached unto all the nations to be a witness, the bishop them got to do what they're doing. IUIC, these camps have to do what they're doing. This message that the black man is really the descendants of the West African Israelites, that message, which is an indictment against the nations, I repeat, us being Israel is an indictment against these nations and they know it. They know that if Yeshua, oh man, they done found out Yeshua was a Negro. They know what that means, that he that led into captivity shall go into captivity. So when y'all ask me like, JB, why has, why are we not in the land? Why does it, and it, cause it really, it's on my heart heavy, you guys. Every time I hear that, my sentiment is with y'all because I hate what we are going through. And I hate that we still in Babylon and I hate that we still gotta be on this rat race and this nine to five and this oppression and this capitalistic, just hatred that we catch from ourselves and from the other nations. I hate it just as much as y'all do or more, right? So I really contemplate when I see these comments and I even see the most high, like most high, why are we going through these things? There are a lot of things that have to take place. We saw that Yeshua just said in Matthew 24 that all these things have to happen and these are just the beginnings. The wars have to increase, the rumors of wars, many false, false these Christian teachers wrapping up and spitting on people's face and doing all this foolishness, all of that has to increase. And the gospel of the kingdom, which works in tangent with the awakening, has to go forth. So Israel has to awaken the gospel of their restor restoration, right? The gospel of the restoration of Israel, them, them being exalted, used as a nation above all nations, and the judgment against all the Gentile nations for what they have done, all of that gotta take place, right? Now we saw this get accelerated at the end of 2019, which was when the curses of Deuteronomy 28 had been fulfilled. Now Yeshua had already purchased by his blood the right to fulfill that, right? But we ourselves were still locked into it because a lot of our people rejected Yeshua because we didn't know that he fulfilled what he had to do. We didn't know all that went into his life. We didn't understand it. Christ was a stumbling block. And he still is today, y'all, because a lot of Israel don't understand Yeshua had to die because somebody had to. When Yeshua died, understand historically, sacrifices were not made in the temple no more. I hope y'all Israelite Old Testaments understand. And I love my brother, y'all understand. I'm not saying that the Most High is not gonna raise up uh, one of us out of Zion as an anointed leader. And can, I'm not cutting that off. But what I am saying is, we don't realize what Yeshua did, right? We don't know the fullness of the price that he paid. 
because after he was crucified, the temple was rent. In 70 AD, they destroyed the temple, so we know that the priests weren't making sacrifices there. Now, before y'all say, well, in Africa, they still making sacrifices. Yeah, they're still making sacrifices, but who atoned for them? Because the entire Levitical priesthood needed atoning. Now, now I can get off into that where David, or in, I believe it's in Isaiah, where he says, blood and sacrifice I don't have pleasure in, but somebody that's doing my will. Because we know that the blood of goats cannot take away the sin of a grown man that committed adultery. Somebody had to pay for that. And this is what the Messiah had to do. Now the Jewish people teach that, okay, one Messiah is gonna die and then the other one gonna come back. Because they even recognized that this had to be justified spiritually. That a lot of loose ends had to be tied up. But I ain't trying to go too deep. Let's go back to Matthew 24. So in Matthew 24, in verse 14 it says, and this gospel of the kingdom Israel awakening to who they are. Israel going to be a nation above all nations in the kingdom. And they rule in a government of peace and love and Torah, right? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world to be a witness unto all the nations. And then the end shall come. In verse 15, it says, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place and whosoever reads this understand that prophecy that abomination of desolation then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains now we saw now it's a lot in that y'all we saw in Luke that Christ said when you see them Romans come when you see them surround Jerusalem when you see that smoke you don't want that smoke on sight run to Africa Right? We know that Yeshua went and fled into Africa, into Egypt, when Herod the Edomite was coming after him. So he's saying, y'all follow my example. Y'all know what the angel told me and, and my mother to do. Go to Africa. Because when Rome comes, it's going to be vengeance. It's going to be vengeance that was so bad, Josephus said he heard chariots leaving Jerusalem. Now that's deep, y'all. It was almost as if the Most High's presence left Israel. And they looked up and they felt all their superhuman strength because our people used to be able to understand one man put a thousand people to death. But in that moment, Israel said, the Most High ain't with us. And they could almost feel it. And Rome wreaked havoc. Destroyed it, raced it, even the foundation was destroyed, right? So bad that they took whoever was left and sent them into captivity. And the ones that went into Africa, we, say, we see they eventually got caught, right? All of this had to come to pass, right? Our people, the temple being destroyed, us being oppressed, the transatlantic wars happening, right? Our people being gunned down, a false Christianity being preached. All of this has to happen in sequence before the end comes. Right now, we are just coming out of the 400 years. Israel's starting to wake up. Y'all are hearing teaching like this. Y'all are like, whoa, where's this been? I've seen a lot of y'all like, man, we haven't heard this. And it's a lot of other Israelites doing this work, but this work is just the beginning because there's so many of our people that don't know they Israel. And if we don't know we're Israel, we can't repent and receive Yeshua from that place, right? Second Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name, this is a national repentance. There is a difference between individual repentance and a nation repentant. And I know this stuff is deep, y'all. Y'all, And I'm, I'm gonna do some, some follow-ups to this, but, but what I want you guys to understand, Yeshua knew he had to die. He knew that when he died, there would be no more sacrifices. History would have it that Yeshua died on Passover. It would have been a Wednesday. Then he resurrected on Saturday, which would have been the Sabbath. We talked about that in Josephus, and I can do another breakdown to see for Bible and all that stuff. Yeshua knew so much, was so calculated, that based on history and every prophecy he claimed that came to pass, he was everything he said he was, y'all. Y'all got to understand. Now, I know we've had a lot of leaders and a lot of Israel saying we got to go to Africa and we need a leader and this kind of thing. But trust the Most High's timing. And first, let's look to Yeshua, y'all. I, I, I know... It might not be the most popular thing to say, y'all. But Yeshua accomplished more than what we realize. Because he atoned from the, for the spiritual disease that plagues us. But Israel has to accept that and say, okay, we accept the plea deal. 
A lot of Israel still trying to go to court in totally on their own merit. And y'all got more confidence than I do. I see to Yeshua. I accept the plea deal by his blood. But until all of Israel does that, through this gospel being preached of us being Israel, we got to wake up. We got to turn back to Torah and the faith of Yeshua. Practicing the law, statutes, and commandments. Keeping them as we rehearse them to the best of our ability. But trusting in the price that Yeshua paid, right? Because he did it and nobody else did. We ain't been sacrificing no goats over here in Babylon. Maybe y'all got some goats in y'all backyard. I ain't been sacrificing no sheep or no turtle dove. I'm just keeping it straight. I'm just keeping it real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So who atoned for that? Yeshua did. By his blood, he purchased the right to cover us in captivity. He knew his life was going to be so valuable that the Council of Nicaea would create a campaign and they create a religion. They would shut the grain of the rice and make white rice, that is Christianity, and spread that to all the nations. But this is chestnut checkers. Yeshua wanted them to spread his life everywhere because that is the very mission he was sent to do to go to all the countries where we were scattered. So he said, in death, I can accomplish that better than in life. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. In death, his life became a world religion that took the Bible everywhere. If that, if his life wasn't as structured as it was, they would not have given us that Bible if they knew it was just a pro-black Israelite book. He deceived them by the calculated nature of his, the way he spoke, the parables, everything he did was so structured that it had to been the most high, y'all. It had to, y'all better hear what I'm saying. He did it in a way that the white European said, we can use this cat. He's saying stuff that sounds so good. Christ was saying stuff like the parable of the wheat and the tares, that the most high gonna have them grow together and then destroy the wheat. And the Romans couldn't even catch what the man was saying. He was talking about how these black folks gonna overcome y'all white folks, these Israelites, and that y'all white folks gonna be burned in the furnace. And they still couldn't catch that thing. That's the power of Yeshua's life. That he got that book sent to the four corners of the earth so that all he had to do was allow his father to open the eyes of our understanding when we found out who we were and now every Israelite got a Bible. In every country they are, right? They got a Bible app, they got a King James, every nation on the earth, right? And these Gentiles that are saying, let's get the gospel everywhere, are really playing right into the hand of the Most High Yah. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. So y'all, this is just a tease y'all, cause I might do a, a bunch of follow-ups exploring everything that Yeshua accomplished from a mathematical, log logical, chess master, wisdom of the most high frame of mind that shows he was everything that he, he said he was, he accomplished everything that had to be accomplished to purchase the right of his return, right? To purchase the right for our return and to get us back to the land. So with that, y'all, peace, love, blessings. I hope this blessed you. I hope this gave you something to think about. I love you guys with the love of the Messiah. Peace, love, blessings, and black power to the chosen race of the Most High Yah. I love you guys. Shalom. All praises.